Hello, everyone. <coughs> Welcome to our session. We're going to start. I hope uh, we have more registrants. Actually, we have 65 registrants, so I'm, I'm sure people will show up. My name is Karim Bogida, Dean of Libraries at Stony Brook University. Uh, our talk is ChatGPT AI <coughs> in higher education. You know, when I proposed this talk, I, I was not expecting the, really this explosion. Um, <laughs> every day, every day there is a new thing, and it's really kind of shaking our world, whether higher education or personal life, teaching, learning, or, or your, your daily life. So this is really, really uh, apropos. So um, I'm going to be the last. So brief introduction. We have really, really distinguished speaker with us. We have Susan D'Agostino. Uh, she's a science writer and scholar and mathematician, former faculty. <laughs> um, if you follow inside her head, so she, she, she's the one. So she has really that broad perspective. And, and then next is uh, Peter uh, Organichak. I hope I didn't butcher your name. <laughs> I met Peter like uh, 11 or 12 years ago at JCDL. Um, he's a DH, uh, data scientist, scholar in information science and also uh, AI. You will hear really good stuff about uh, like um, how we use the GPT, even before chat GPT. And then we have um, Bori Zheng, uh, NLP expert within the University of Florida Libraries. As far as I know, she's the only NLP librarian in the US, and tell me if I'm wrong. We need more people like her. And then I'll present at the end, my, my talk will be more over the geopolitics of uh, ChatGPT at the macro level. So, welcome again. Please ask questions, comments, because I'm sure you have many. <laughs> so, Susan, and please uh, inter say something about you. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you all. My name is Susan D'Agostino. I'm the technology and innovation reporter at Inside Higher Ed, and I'm really glad to be here, part of this conversation. Um, I show up at conferences because I learn from all of you, and um, so you know, stop me in the hallway, have coffee with me. <laughs> I'd love to meet you. OK, so what I'd like to do today um, is tell you a story, because I'm a storyteller. <laughs> How did I get to uh, Inside Higher Ed and reporting on technology? And how did, how did I arrive at this moment? And what am I doing right now? Um, and I think the best way is probably, um, well, let me begin a little bit by telling you my background. So I've actually been steeped in higher ed for uh, several decades. <laughs> um, I'm trained as a mathematician, as Karim pointed out, and um, I was a professor for a decade, um, tenure, taught my heart out, loved it. I was at um, a, a, an open access regional university um, that I took great pride in teaching in that setting. I, I always loved writing, and I, uh, I thought, if, if I'm not, you know, I need to at some point do writing more seriously. So I left teaching about five years ago and pivoted my career to journalism with the idea that my interest in math and science, I could contribute and teach in a different way, um, that it would be public facing math and science literacy. Um, I, in my job at Inside higher ed, I talk with students, professors, administrators, librarians, of course, <laughs> staff members. And uh, they actually inform my stories very much. And I'm grateful for all of my sources. Many of my stories have typically at least three people quoted in them from the higher education community. But often, I might speak to 15 or 20 even <laughs> before I actually get that story right. Um, I, meet people at conferences, and I also uh, call them up and <laughs> cold call and or you know email typically first, and then set up a time to talk. Um, 
And next year, I'm actually going to be headed to Columbia University. I will still be publishing in Inside Higher Ed, which I'm very excited about, um, doing some more long form pieces specifically on the topic of artificial intelligence and the disruption and opportunity that that presents in higher education. So what I've been writing lately, if you've followed Inside Higher Ed or any of my stories, um, you know, I have short, medium, and long-term term stories, um, but many of them are short-term, and you know, they, I, I turn around stories pretty quickly. Um, but next year, I'll be focusing specifically on the topic of this panel and um, you know, narrating <laughs> the conversation as we go, that first draft of history, as we call journalism. Um, so let me, again, share a little bit of a story here with you. So if we want to back up until last fall, so this was my first story in Inside Higher Ed, Computer Science's Challenges as Seen by Its Pioneers. Every year I attend the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. I have for, I think, the past four or five years, and I will this year again. This is um, an invitation-only meeting with all of the Turing Award winners. They are the equivalent of the Nobel recipients in computer science. They are the ones who are responsible for all of the technology that powers our lives. And they are deeply concerned. They are excited about the, the, their, their inventions, but they're also deeply concerned about the use of them. So this was um, my first story that there was something on the horizon <laughs> where I, um, you know, they were talking with me about some of the concerns. At that meeting, um, it, it was very interesting. I, I saw some of them, and they tend not to be terribly animated when marvelous things happen <laughs> in technology. And yet I saw some of them chattering about GPT-3, which is the technology that powers chat GPT. And I thought, what is impressing them so much? <laughs> so that, you know, these luminaries um, were really marveling over it. So I went back home, um, that was September, and um, let's see, so this was in October. I published my first story based on that tip. So, you know, the reporter's life is to try to stay ahead of the curve <laughs> so that you all can be informed and get information that you need that, um, you know, you can use to inform your work. So in October, I wrote this first story, Machines Can Craft Essays, How Should Writing Be Taught Now? And this was an interesting story because I had a little bit of time. I took some time to write this one. I called up uh, experts and researchers who actually had been spending some time with these AI writing tools. This was not a situation where a professor in the classroom found out about this tool and needed to adapt in one day. This was, these were researchers who informed this story and talked to me a lot about both um, you know, the, you know, the risks that this posed, that, um, you know, that some um, teaching and learning practices may need to go, ba go by the wayside um, in the presence of these new tools. And yet there would also be a lot of opportunities in teaching and learning that maybe faculty hadn't thought of before. So I like this story because uh, I liked working on it because I actually had some time to think. Okay, we all remember January of this year, right? <laughs> when ChatGPT was released. And I think, I actually am very, um, you know, when I think about all of my readers or inside higher ed's readers, I think about them as real people who are working hard <laughs> and trying to do well by their students. Um, and, you know, with the best that higher ed can be. And I remember being a faculty member in the classroom and having so many demands, faculty meetings and, um, you know, faculty senate and student and office hours and, um, you know, grading and, you know, okay, I just worked hard on this lecture and now I need another one. Um, you know, so I, I remember that life and I remember how busy it is and how demanding it is. And what I think my role is is that I have a little bit of time to go and talk to the people I need to go and talk to so that you can be informed so that you can do your jobs better. 
And often what I try to do is look at all sides and lay it out because I know how intelligent you all are and, um, and that you, know, you can form your own opinion. And many people do land in different places. And um, you know, I think that's important to understand that all of those different views. So this story, I understood that something big was happening in January, not unlike uh, what the switch to emergency remote teaching and when faculty just needed to adapt in a week or two <laughs> and you know they were sent home and okay your classes are online now and something was happening like that in january so this piece i actually edited i, I wrote the intro but what i did was i um you know I, I looked for diverse sources in terms of um students administrators and faculty different ages, um, different disciplines, you know, as much diversity as I could. And I, I reached out to these people and I said, tell me one thing, people who had experience with these tools, and I said, tell me one thing if you had to give a piece of advice. And, you know, I put these together. Um, so, you know, be deliberate, adjust quickly, don't abandon pencil and paper, question how writing is taught, think a few years out, I like that one. <laughs> that was actually interesting in that moment. Delegate, identify shortcomings, you know, so again, so this, you know, reminds students to think, another important one, even though these tools were here, they had arrived, <laughs> um, there was a lot of advice. And that, um, that piece was, um, I'm really grateful for all of the sources who contributed to it because I believe it, it helped in the moment. And my job is just to continue following the conversation wherever you all are taking it. So next up was AI writing detection, because a lot of people were, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, are these tools going to be uh, used for cheating? Um, or, um, you know, how are we, you know, and, or, you know, if, if the ed tech companies come with their tools, are they going to be used to penalize students inappropriately? Um, you know, there are a lot of questions there. And so I, you know, ended up talking with a lot of, um, mostly faculty for this one, I believe, um, where, you know, they, there were many who were saying, we need to under, you know, this is not exactly about catching students. Most, in fact, were saying it's not at all about that. But yet, there was still value in understanding the difference between machine written prose and human prose. And that not only was that important so that we can understand when something that, you know, a piece of writing that is, you know, putting forth some ideas um, is written by a human, but that there's actually some really engaging intellectual conversations to be had there about what really does make writing human. So not just the mechanics of it, which I explain a little bit of how the AI writing detectors work in this story, which actually fascinated me. I was really excited to learn about that. There are fun words such as perplexity and burstiness, if you haven't um, learned about those. <laughs> um, they're, they're really fun to think about. But also just how can we use this moment to bring out our humanity, um, which is something to celebrate. Okay, next up, faculty were telling me <laughs> they were finding that some of them were putting their questions from tests or, uh, you, know, um, you know, essay assignments into chat GPT. And some of them, some of them were saying, oh, no, this is, it didn't do very well. It, you know, would have gotten a C or a D or not well at all. But some faculty were telling me, I put my questions that I've long used or the kinds of questions that I've often relied on, I put them into chat GPT and they, um, you know, gave a beautiful answer. <laughs> so faculty were telling me that they were having to, uh, some of them were finding band-aids that would work this, this semester, but that they were needing to think a lot more deeply about how to ask questions. And that was actually really, compelling to think about and narrate that change. A lot of the discussion initially in January, February, um, and let's see, this one, you know, mo I would say all of January and most of February was a lot about something 
Um, unprecedented, unprecedented is happening. Do we need to worry about cheating or not? What kinds of questions are we asking students? But then I started hearing faculty grow concerned. Some, not a lot actually, because understandably a lot was happening. But some were telling me that there were um, some risks that could be posed to students. That you could bring this you know, chat GPT into your classroom and you know, t send the students off to write an assignment with it. Um, and you know, a student might, for example, ask, is my life worthwhile? ChatGPT is not similar at all. What faculty were learning is that it's not at all similar to the chat bots that are found often on admission, college admission websites or library websites even. Those typically are designed specifically for universities and they answer a very narrow set of questions. They do not go beyond it. They uh, are targeted specifically for you know, the, the public, you know, the, the consumers, the 18 to 22 year olds, or whatever um, demographic your institution serves. And what these faculty members were telling me is that this is a tool from the outside. It was not designed for our specific population. And there may be some guard, guardrails needed for these tools. Um, at the same time, you know, this is, there's a lot of, there were a lot of balls in the air <laughs> that the faculty were trying to keep up because they were also telling me, for example, faculty were beginning to develop some of their own philosophies. And I saw at least two camps. Um, one camp was telling me, it's a great tool. Let's keep our um, oversight <laughs> and you know, use it as an opportunity to have more conversations with students. And some faculty were saying, I, I always encourage the students to start with ChatGPT. For those students who face a blank page with dread, it can be a really wonderful way to jumpstart some you know, thought. And then the student can take over at some point um, shortly after using it to start an assignment. Other faculty were saying, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that that bypasses the student's original thought. They need to start with a blank page, even if it's hard, and they need to see what they think first. So, and then there were some who were neutral and hadn't decided because of, let's all be honest, this is <laughs> happening very quickly. Um, and yet some were also identifying that there were certain populations of students for whom it was really serving well. For example, some uh, faculty shared that some of their more neurodivergent students found it to be a very patient uh, debate, debater <laughs> um, who, you know, they could ask many, many questions. So, you know, our job is really, as a reporter, is just to listen <laughs> to all of you and try to craft that into stories. This story that came out this week by my colleague Liam Knox, can turn it in, cure higher ed's AI fever. Um, I was working on another story, he picked this one up, <laughs> and I was very grateful. Um, is also another story about, okay, an ed tech company has come out with a product, and it, you know, we, we only, most of us were only paying attention to ChatGPT at the beginning of the semester, and already this product is being released, and what implications does it have? You know, we, we're all familiar with plagiarism detectors, but plagiarism detectors uh, actually give evidence when they say there's a piece, a sentence, or a paragraph, or longer, that has been plagiarized. They can say, here's the paragraph, and go look over there. That is where it was lifted from. AI writing detectors are different. They only speak in likelihoods. There's no evidence. And that's a fundamental difference between the writer, the um, AI, I'm sorry, between plagiarism detectors and writing detectors. That brings you up to the current moment. This one, as I said, was published this week. Um, let me. So what am I thinking about now? <laughs> right now, 
I'm thinking about this letter that many tech leaders came out with about should we pause AI? And I haven't written this story yet. I need all of you to tell me <laughs> what it needs to be in it. Does higher ed, is there any piece that we should be pausing right now um, in terms of these AI writing tools? Because we need more time um, you know, to draft policies. On the note of time, I want to add that um, it feels like it's been a long time since January, but I would urge you to remember that we're really in the infancy of this development. Um, there, you know, it can seem like if you go on social media or you hear some of the voices who are leaders and for whom I'm very grateful, who are talking a lot about these products, um, that it can seem sometimes like everybody is up to date. <laughs> And I assure you, actually, that's not the case. There was a study that just came out. I wrote about it in one of my stories that I believe was current um, as of the first, um, I'm sorry, it was at some point in March, so very recent, where um, only 18%, I believe, it was 17 or 18% of faculty have developed AI writing policies for their classrooms, and only 14% of universities have. We're just at the beginning of this. Uh, there is, you know, if you're feeling like the train's left the station, it has not. Join us, join the conversation. <laughs> my, my guess is you're at this conference. Most of you are engaged in this conversation and, and possibly even leading it at your institutions. And that's a really important role, so that's great. Um, but anyway, this is, you know, what I'm thinking about for my next story. Um, you know, given the disruption, should higher ed pause any aspect of AI writing tools in any way. And I've got uh, my email up there, and if you have a .edu email, I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to send me a short conversational paragraph. A little longer is fine if that's easier for you, but um, I'm actually interested in hearing what you have to say. And if you're someone who hasn't been quoted in a newspaper before, I especially want to hear from you. So, um, but everybody is welcome. So I will leave it there. Thank, Thank you, you, Susan. Peter. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Dr. Peter Organischuk. I am a professor at uh, University of Denver, just here in town. Um, I've been at Denver for six years. Um, I still don't understand the weather, so you'd be forgiven for also not understanding it. I described it to a friend yesterday as typically atypical, and I think that describes it well. Um, you never know what you're gonna get, other than when there's a conference, it usually snows. Uh, so, uh, I'm a professor in library and information science. Uh, so, uh, my role here today is to talk a little bit about the, the research, uh, um, the scholarly research side, as well as the, the teaching side. Um, Sure. So um, my, my research is in text mining. Um, as Kareem said, uh, I come from digital humanities. And um, uh, I work um, in applied methods when it comes to text mining. So uh, I'm very rarely doing you know, algorithmic work um, developing the methods. It's more uh, seeing how we can use these methods in libraries and in and in information science. Uh, my work is primarily in two spaces. One is uh, content-based methods for, I'll hide that for now, I'll, I'll get there. Um, one is content-based methods for understanding large digital libraries, right? So um, a number of you uh, in this room I've interacted with in my past role at the Hadi Trust Digital Library. Uh, I, I work on ways of understanding these large scanned book collections um, uh, at scales uh, at scales in which we can't really read them. Right. Uh, my other area of work, um, a bit more recent, is an automated 
um, educational assessment. So uh, the Library of Information Science at University of Denver is in a school of ed. So I work with uh, educational psychologists on developing ways to uh, measure uh, tests of creativity. Right? So creativity is something that uh, we've had tests for since the 50s, uh, but they're very rarely used. They're, you very rarely see the, a test of creativity in education because it's just really tough to grade. Um, you, can, you have to have an open-ended test. Uh, so the past couple of years, I've been working on automated methods um, uh, for, for scoring those types of tests. Uh, and I'll show in a moment some, some results from, from a recent study, uh, actually super recent, um, that show the power of large language models uh, and chat GPT included uh, in that space. Um, finally, I'm also working on, uh, uh, I'm currently working on a study of uh, GPT-based writing interventions. Um, essentially, uh, what we're doing is we have a, a browser-based tool uh, that's backed by ChatGPT um, in the back end, and it really helps, um, it works to help students in overcoming the tyranny of the blank page. Uh, so it's, a, it's an auditor. It doesn't write anything for you. Rather, it talks with you to help tease out uh, your thoughts on what you want to write. Um, you know, as, as somebody that uh, is an immigrant from a non-English speaking country, I know what it's like sometimes uh, uh, being unable to, having an idea and being unable to express it. So uh, what we're doing in that study is we're comparing uh, this customized discussion around your writing to generic uh, writing advice. Uh, in my teaching, um, I'm also trying to, uh, I'm struggling very currently uh, with adapting to the presence of things like ChatGPT in the classroom. Uh, for example, I'm teaching a programming class now where I'm implementing ChatGPT as a tool uh, while trying to contextualize how it can be used. Right, so as Susan mentioned, there are, there are lots of concerns in higher ed around uh, these types of tools. Um, and uh, uh, that, that really present challenges to how we think about assessment in the classroom. However, uh, library science is a very applied professional, um, I, have it, I have it blanked out right now. Um, it's a very, uh, uh, it, it's a professional degree, right? So um, uh, ChatGPT when it comes to programming is a valuable supplemental tool in programming. Um, uh, the challenge, however, is uh, it really um, is more beneficial when you know the foundations for what you're doing. Um, so uh, the challenge is trying to communicate to students, we need to learn the foundations because then, um, then you can use uh, a tool like ChatGPT more effectively. Um, you know, so if you prematurely use it, uh, you actually won't be able to, to work as efficiently. Um, my other role here today is uh, as, as a um, scholar that works in this area uh, is to present some of the jargon. Um, uh, so uh, sort of take us to now uh, when it comes to chat, chat GPT and similar tools. So uh, some of you may have taken classes like um, uh, text analysis or information retrieval when you're in school. Uh, some of you have it, that's okay. Uh, the, uh, but historically, one thing that we've worked a lot with is this idea of bag of words, where when we try to represent text uh, computationally, uh, we really treat it as a set of words. Um, and the reason for that is not because it works well, but because it's just really hard to, uh, to model how, how words interact with each other, like uh, the order, the sequence of words. Um, uh, we've long struggled to come up with ways of uh, using, using the information in the sequence of words, right? So a bag of words just jumbles up words, each word is treated similarly. However, um, it, over the past 10 years, uh, we've seen uh, sort of a resurgence of neural networks, or about 10 years ago we saw neural networks um, 
uh, come back from, from their previous heyday uh, in the 90s. Um, and we started experimenting with a type of neural network called a recurrent neural network, which can map a sequence. Um, the problem with text um, and, uh, is there's so much of it. Uh, so it was computationally intractable. Uh, and the big thing that really made uh, the tools that we're using now possible was this idea called attention. Uh, attention is really uh, just a concept that lets a neural network focus on what matters. So rather than focusing uh, you know, on every word piece by piece and how, how uh, uh, the de dependencies of each word uh, um, uh, function altogether, it can sort of focus on important words, skipping less important words. Um, and that makes it more computationally tractable. So attention led to uh, models uh, called transformers, um, and transformer-based language models are often called large language models, as, as we heard. Um, and uh, these large language models, uh, they're built uh, using really large training corpora. Um, so the other thing that really became prominent uh, 10 years ago was this idea of transfer learning. Uh, so rather than every time you have a task, you take a corpus of text and you, you teach, you create a model yourself off of that corpus, uh, with transfer learning, uh, the idea was you repurpose other people's models. Uh, so starting with a tool called uh, word to vec exactly 10 years ago, uh, we really started uh, working off this idea of somebody with a lot of computational power trains a really powerful model, and then we can repurpose that model uh, and we can fine tune it. So if we have a very customized task, we can train it a little bit more based off of our uh, off of our specific use case. Uh, in contrast to, to fine tuning, where we tailor a model to our use case, uh, the other thing we've seen in recent years is uh, uh, the remarkable effectiveness of few shot or zero shot learning, where you give a model very few examples and it understands your task mainly because it learned the language so well that it can interpret it. Uh, so that's what we're often doing with something like ChatGPT. Uh, we're, uh, we're using prompt-based, uh, uh, or we're, uh, we're using prompt-based uh, few-shot or zero-shot learning. So zero-shot, you don't give any examples. Few-shot, you only give a few examples. Uh, but you're using an out-of-the-box model in, uh, in any case. A uh, couple other things um, that bring us to now. Uh, one has been the idea of scaling laws. Uh, so there's a paper um, that now we're starting to see pushback against uh, that came out of OpenAI a couple of years ago that said, the bigger your model is, the smarter it gets. Um, so that's why we've seen OpenAI training these bigger and bigger models. GPT-3 cost $12 million in, uh, in computational uh, resources to train, for example. Um, the other thing we're seeing more recently is what you're training off of matters. So you want a lot of, a lot of text, so usually uh, you use um, crawls of, of the, the internet, but you also want it to be clean, so deduplicated um, and without a lot of uh, uh, sort of junk documents. Um, the last thing we've seen in recent years has been uh, a concept called reinforcement learning from human feedback. And that's really what, um, that allows us to help guide the models uh, from human, human feedback, exactly what it sounds like. Um, and that gives us the ability to tune these models a little bit better than in the past. So we can introduce more safety and anti-bias interventions. Um, uh, and, and that's how ChatGPT or GPT-4, Google's BARD, uh, they work in that way. All right. Um, and then uh, one last, last little thing is how these models actually work, which is uh, they're probabilistic. They're uh, trying to, based on an input, uh, their text-to-text -text, um, generative models, they try to generate an output based on an input, uh, but they usually have a temperature setting where there's some randomness 
a randomness thrown in. You can turn that down um, so you get the most likely answer, uh, but that randomness actually, I, I would argue, adds to a lot of that human-like feeling, the, the fact that it, it doesn't always give you the, the robotic best answer. All right, so I want to show you, uh, so that slide I had hidden um, was just some of those definitions, but there you go. <laughs> um, uh, so I want to show you uh, results from a recent paper on um, uh, scoring uh, originality, which is a part of creativity. Uh, so uh, up until now, the best automated scoring methods have uh, operated, let me show you uh, that column where it says overall, they've had a correlation with human judges of 0.12 or up to 0.26. Not great. Um, however, over the course of a larger test, uh, um, that starts looking better and better. Uh, in our recent work, uh, we used large language models. Oh, that, that's a little bit off. Um, we used large language models uh, that were fine-tuned. And you can see uh, it's a massive, massive improvement uh, where one is perfect correlation with human raters, zero is no correlation. Uh, we get up to 0.82 correlation, right? So these models are able to learn a bit of that sense of uh, uh, the language um, and that sense of the task. Um, and I won't go into the details of the task, but what matters is it's really big. Um, and it also learns uh, what this chart uh, in the corner shows. It also learns uh, very well with just a few texts. Um, all right, uh, in contrast to fine-tuned models, uh, you can also do the, the sort of prompt-based models uh, where you actually uh, give some examples to the model and uh, it tries to guess based off, of, based off of those examples, it tries to guess the, uh, the uh, answer for other examples. And you can see uh, if you give it zero examples, GPT-3 does fairly poorly, um, comparable to the uh, previous state of the art. Um, uh, if you give it five examples, it already surpasses that, but not as good as fine tuning. However, um, uh, adding chat GPT in there, it's a little bit better uh, and, uh, and much cheaper. Um, and then if you add chat GPT four, uh, you can see now we're approaching uh, uh, what fine-tuned models do. Um, so this is using just, just prompting. Um, so, uh, and again, uh, for reference, that's the uh, baseline there. Uh, so, uh, one thing Susan mentioned was uh, um, uh, faculty mentioning, you know, this didn't give a very good response in some cases, well, sometimes it does. Uh, that sort of concern, I think, um, is limited, so uh, or is uh, time limited. So one thing that I think is important to, to know is the quality of these results just keeps getting uh, stronger and stronger as the models get larger, um, and that's that uh, will factor into the, any conversation I think moving forward. Uh, but yeah, with that, I, I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Hello everyone, I'm Bree John. I'm the natural language processing specialist librarian from University of Florida. My department is a new department too. As you hear, my title is pretty new here. Um, it's um, academic research consulting and services department. I'm very glad to be here today. Um, so how many of you have used ChatGPT so far? Very nice, okay, this is a nice crowd. Yes, yes. Um, because uh, Kareem mentioned that um, I might be the first uh, AI librarian get hired, I would love to um, start my talk with introduce you a little bit about what I do in my libraries. So here's a little bit about my um, training background. I got my BA in, uh, oh actually it's a BS, sorry, it's a typo, um, in educational technology where I learned um, pedagogical theories and a little bit um, programming um, from my bachelor degree, and I did my um, MA and PhD in min, uh, major in linguistics and minor in computer science at the University of um, 
Minnesota Twin Cities. And what my project was about using NLP AI machine learning method to document endangered languages, and it's also sometimes called the low resource languages. The, today, why we're so fascinated about ChatGPT is because we all know about English. And if you use another language to test it out, especially the low resource languages, you will find this is a rather not very useful tool for your research. Um, so these are some of the language that I've been working on before. So when I introduce my role to other people, I love to introduce uh, NLP as a combination of computer science and linguistics. And I will put an emphasis on the linguistic side, no matter the overload information you got these days about um, ChatGPT or any natural language processing related application, I think they're all trying to figure out either all of these aspects in linguistics or some of them based on the acoustic um, patterns, um, how the morphemes working together. Morpheme means part of the words, maybe not the words. When morphemes put together, we got a words. When words put together, we got a sentence, and the sentence has structures. When sentence has structures, we start interpreting, interpreting the semantics meaning of it. And once we have semantics of it, of, about it, and you put people together, and you share your thoughts, and that's pragmatics. So usually NLP is trying to tackle all these questions, and I would rather say those are traditional questions that we're still working on, and AI machine learning in general is trying to help us to take another advanced step to solve these traditional questions. And here is my, uh, some of my department structure, you might be interested. Uh, we have a lot of um, folks that expertise in other area, and I happen to be the first little icon named artificial intelligence. So if we got a patron question, consultation, or collaboration request, and they will see that, and they'll click on it, and then find my contact information from that. But we do have all sorts of other um, services that my department provides. So when I introduce myself to my patron, I usually tell them this, I have two hats. One is AI related, where I support all research that done by student groups, faculty, or labs, um, university staffs on their AI or NLP related projects. And um, I also conduct uh, internal library employee trainings to just learn a little bit more about AI. And we, we tend to make it a little bit low mathematic low uh, programming to just let people uh, get interested in this area and not scare them away from the programming side. And I also collaborate with um, different research group. If I see I have a, a pretty useful role, role in their projects, I will collaborate. Um, so I, later I will share a little bit about what are the ongoing projects I've been collaborating on campus. So why I got hired? Um, why University of Florida? We have this pretty big um, AI initiatives that um, there are many, many, many implementation about this initiative, and I'm just highlighting this two direct influence on me or my department. One is um, that we have campus-wide AI faculty hiring. Uh, so far, there are more than 100 faculty members that doing AI already hired and started their working. And the goal is to implement AI machine learning to, into all departments' curriculum. And uh, so I, I was happened to be the first one that hired by the libraries. And I also, day to day, my daily job is to first log into this uh, computing system. It's, we call it Hypergator. Um, it's um, partially sponsored by this uh, chip company called NVIDIA. We have some allocation that um, granted to my department, and we have a group of people support unfunded students' project um, that um, if they're, because they, it's not free, if their faculty member cannot afford it, but we also do not want this encouraged student to, to give up their project, they will come to find us, and we give them a, period, a short period of time to test out what they can do with this um, uh, computing cluster. Okay, and some ongoing projects. So this first one, um, I, I have three cases here, but I would like to just give you a type of what kind of collaboration I usually do. So this is a clinical research lab. So it's a lab that involves multiple faculty member and the graduate students. So their mission is to uh, study clinical notes. Sometimes we also call it um, 
EHR, electronic health records, and there are notes by doctors or nurses, it's very messy, and their goal is to use NLP to uh, extract the information that this specific group people um, care about. So they study uh, infant feeding status. So uh, it's a pretty straightforward pipeline, and you find your way to manually label those uh, relevant information through massive passage, and you find the relevant, you, you, you just basically test out all these NLP-related algorithms and implement them, and see which one can help you predict the best labels for this information. So we test it out and then find some um, really great algorithm to suggest maybe this um, in the future other labs or other university or research group can uh, keep using that. And here just an example showing you different hospitals, groups that have very different uh, forms to keep patient information. And it's really time consuming task for new doctors or new nurses to go through all these and find information. And the worst case is um, there are very critique um, diagnoses, but uh, overlooked by doctors. And um, maybe that's a cancerous. And when they realize, oh, that's a piece of information that's already past the best treatment time. So doing NLP for um, EHR data is one of the uh, leading research in uh, an LP field. And so how we do that as a group, um, there are many, many annotation tools that um, different labs would la like to do. Usually, uh, this is just an example, it's called Team TED, but it's just an example. There are many, many more. I'm, I'm, I believe that there are um, publisher companies also offer some um, annotation too, and uh, we would love to learn about that. Usually, these tools will give you this, some agenda that a PI can put a very structured nose and assign to their group of people, and also see okay, this person think the most important information is this word and this sentences, but th when the same passage passed to another person in the lab and they have a different opinion, and the PI will get a flag, okay, different people disagree with this. So this is really fundamentally reduced the bias in AI when you have multiple people to judge the same piece of information. Uh, this is just a screenshot, sorry about this, words is very little, but this is just a um, very useful tool, so you don't have to program that much. You just highlight the information you need, and then um, select the labels that you think is correct. If there are disagreement between annotators, the PI will get flagged. So that was a collaboration that I'm currently doing with a lab. Um, at uh, uh, College of Medicine, and this, this second one is a pure faculty group. Um, they're, folk, they're from um, agriculture, and they wanted to use NLP to explore urban green space planning. So uh, why NLP is relevant to this, to um, agriculture. They wanna know users' opinion about how to plan a city or urban area more friendly to users. So they are actually targeting on Google reviews, um, Yelp reviews, and trying to see what comments that people, users, um, park visitors care about. So that's where you, NLP can get in, and there's an NLP task called topic modeling. So it just review all these massive messages and it suggests you a certain number of topics that you might wanna start with. There, yes, there are bias, biases everywhere and you might miss um, some really great topics that the model didn't return to you. That's why every time when we say we apply machine learning method is just, um, the, to begin with, there are many, many other follow-up steps that needed before the final product. And the third one is a pure student group, and they are met, um, I work with them. This is a group that I code more for because they're new. They come to the library and find me. They say, okay, this is what we found. We're all medical doctor students, and we're fascinated by from, so this, there is a, they, um, database called PubMed, if, you, um, if you're in the medical area, that's um, you're the first place you go. And so they are, there are some keywords about this group. They care, they, 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 they are the future surgeons. 
and they do surgery. They will do, be doing surgery for um, pediatric this area, the, two, the second keywords. But they often find that they want to find the basic research literature, but often the PubMed return them a whole bunch of paper that is clinical based. It's not very useful. So they come to me saying, okay, do you think NLP can play a role here? You, maybe you can uh, do some supervised learning. And well, they, they did have some uh, intro of machine learning. That's why they found me, but um, they did not have programming backgrounds. So I helped them use this large language models to uh, tokenize their um, giant literature collection and then further developed this classifier that can predict either a literature is more about pediatric basics research or clinical. And there's just some uh, results that um, is, is not very important to this meeting, but just I would like to share with you these are all based on large language models. And actually we heard about large language models a lot. And you, how about we think a reverse way? Is there any small language models? Why people don't talk about small language models? Why all of a sudden large language models? That's a really fair question. It's just because large language models, I, I guess we have to thank G, ChatGPT, really talk about, we know what language is, we know what models can be, but language model, what that is. So ChatGPT is a really good example, uh, thanks to the, for the media, let us learn a little bit about language model. The traditional small language model really means that it can not do much things. You. You, you separately train a thing with rule-based, right? You say, oh, if this, then that, if this, then that. But you cannot adapt this to another field. Large language models, yes, is mostly deep learning neural network based and it can do a lot of things. One of the important things is today a lot of AI featured things are powered by large language model as a core. So it cannot, usually cannot stand by itself. It needs a lot of downstream specific tasks that um, multiple people, folks today have mentioned. Fine tuning is a very important step that you use this gigantic language model to build something specifically for yourself. And that um, is very doable because you don't need a lot of computing resources for a fine tuning project because uh, presumably your data set is relatively small. But the outcome is just uh, very great compared with those earlier small language models. Um, so apparently there are history about language models. I think it was starting in the 1950s, uh, Georgetown experiment, if you have heard about that. That's a task by um, um, IBM Watson, um, uh, they're trying to translate 60 Russian sentence into English. And that's how, where language model started, if you're wondering about that. Um, so here are, so how about ChatGPT today? ChatGPT definitely made my work a little bit more busier these days. And I got a lot of questions from patrons and someone, some faculty member just said, okay, I need to tell my students, I'm teaching this computer science course. Tell me more about this, I need to teach this, this, this um, chapter. And so they ask about what re reinforcement learning is. So I will say one of the biggest thing about ChatGPT, very wonderful, is about this reinforcement learning. Basically, it's just review. We all, we all can be this in part of this reinforcement learning because once you use ChatGPT, there is a thumbs up and thumbs down button. And that's reinforcement learning. If you press some, up and they will add a little bit weight, more weight to say, oh, that's a good answer. My customer love it. If you thumb down, you helped, you, you contribute another data set for their entire training process. But before they launch that, who, 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 who they use? And they hired foreign country, very cheap laborers in Kenya by paying them $2 per day or something, or per hour, well, I think it's per day. And it's really cheap labor. And I would like to bring some concerns about, you know, it's not, building fancy large language models is not only about the, uh, the programmers, it's also about the human loop. We have to value the intelligence that other people bring to the team. So that's about reinforcement learning. And 
other popular questions. So what's the goal of ChatGPT? What do you want to do? I think ChatGPT is really just want to have a conversation. Um, it's not going to um, it's not originally aiming to give you any evidence-based thing for your professional work. Um, if you think that's a pretty, pretty good, you can have a pretty good conversation with this, that's their original purpose. But someone could um, come up to me and say, wait a minute, I don't want to have a wonderful chat casually, I just want to help um, have something help my work. So we found out the chat GBT lies a lot of time about citations, reference information. But if you think about in the engineering side, it lies, but it lies in the right category. It lies in citation. It didn't lie by giving you an image of hot dogs. Right, you, you, you won't feel threatened if it returns you a picture of a hot dog. But because it's so close, it's trying to keep up the conversation, but because it's statistic-based, it, there is no fact-checking checking well-established in this system. So we found, okay, you're trying to give me a reference, but it's not existing. Again, that's not their original goal, but it could be their immediate goal. Um, just because the work pipeline so seems pretty straightforward if someone want to build a fact-checking system to against it, right? Get a database of all the real ones. ChatGPT is here. Let's go checking, right? It's pretty straightforward. Someone has to do that. Um, yeah, any unexpected outcome, of course. Um, I'm not going to say much about it. So. My, this is my last slide. Uh, I want to leave enough time for. Oh my goodness! Okay, my 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 goal as a new librarian is um, there are a lot of needs to just learn basic things about AI, about natural language processing in general. So I love how media bring ChatGPT to everybody's attention. So I ha will have opportunity to say, okay. ChatGPT is just one example of large language models. Large language models is just one example of language models. And language models can do a lot of different natural language processing tasks. So depending on your own research paper and your, the data set that you have, you can do many, many more. So the, I'm back engineering everything and trying to bring more AI librarians to, um, to my circle. Thank you so much. Thank you for all and all. Actually, I'm going to skip my presentation and give you, um, I'm going to do a special Zoom for that. I have to make an executive decision because we barely have uh, three, four minutes. So I'm going to do a special Zoom around the geopolitics and the economic model behind those companies because there's a whole thing, you know, behind the scenes. And also this AGI, artificial intelligence, sentience, and the divide between researcher, whether we should stop or not, and even even the godfathers of AI are divided. So I'll do a special session for that. I want to open the debate now. Like, please ask us questions. We need a volunteer. <laughs> Otherwise, we can close. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, Clem Guthrie, University Librarian, University of Hawaii. Uh, also the interim director of the UH Press. Uh, how do we deal with the ethical issues of those false citations? So currently, I have a researcher in Canada who contacted the press saying the press published a book, which the press did not publish. She got the, the citation from ChatGPT. She's now being accused of academic dishonesty. Wow. Uh, you want to answer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The short answer is I would report on this. <laughs> um, I think it's the question is who's doing the accusation, and um, you know, the, you know the policies are being developed right now, and um, you know if the policy was not in place, then that would be a concern. That you know, so. Um, this is all being worked out. I don't, I think that um, these conversations, you know, I'm having, um, you know, a month from now, I'm, uh, you know, essentially leading 
the Digital Universities US conference in Chicago. And um, every session I'm leading, I'm going to be talking about ethics, <laughs> you know, the ethics of going to college in the metaverse, um, you know, the ethics of, in, of AI um, in research, in publishing. Um, so I don't have an answer. I don't know. Do, do any of you have an answer? I, all I can say is that. Does this work? Um, I, I think uh, at some point we really need to think about the literacy skills around tools like this because uh, they're here um, and they're good for some things, they're very poor at other things. Um, how do we equip people to understand this will hallucinate uh, citations? Um, and I have to say, you know, from the perspective of an educator, I have no idea how, how you teach the, that literacy. Um, like, like Bree said, you know, it's, um, uh, it's almost, uh, I would liken it to almost to understanding Wikipedia when that came around, right? Uh, Wikipedia is so often reliable, except when it's not. Um, so you, you, you get sort of lulled into this false sense of trusting it. Um, and I, I think uh, a tool like ChatGPT uh, is similar in that uh, it feels right, it feels right, and like we said, it'll give you those fake answers in a realistic sounding way, which makes interpreting uh, and, and judging the, the quality of that very difficult. So I, I don't, don't know where we, where we go in educating people, um, but that will be, I think that'll be a big thing in higher ed. And I would just add quickly that the, these tools don't exist only in academe. I think you were hinting at that, that you know, our, the students are going to graduate into workplaces where they are omnipresent. So um, you know, I encourage all of you to take the lead, because if not, the ed, ed tech companies may. Last question. We'll have to arm wrestle for it. Um, okay. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors? It's all good. Uh, I, I just was wondering, and sorry, um, uh, the gentleman from Denver here, what, um, what are you doing for your students now to prepare them for you know, what happens? Because I'm going to be probably hiring some of those kids, and I'm just wondering, are you doing prompt engineering? You know, what kind of, what, how is it impacting the next generation of librarians? Yes. Oh, uh, um, uh, the the short answer is I'm not sure yet. I'm sort of building the car as as I go along, like many other educators. Um, so right now I'm teaching a class that's really data analysis, um, and uh, what I'm trying to do is establish here are these fundamental skills, um, and then uh, what. Um, what I have planned for later in the quarter is um, a session on sort of bootstrapping, uh, working as, with ChatGPT as a pair programmer um, to bootstrap your skills to be able to do something just one step further than you were able to, to do it. Um, but uh, how is, is still up in the air, um, and it's really, really a, a new consideration that many of us are just starting to struggle with. I would just add a very short answer. I think um, it's better for students to get their um, hands-on experience as soon as possible. Find a very uh, small scaled uh, first experiment to let them get started from data cleaning. Um, G Chat GPT or GPT-4 spent if not more than 85% of the time just dealing with data and they should get their practice started as soon as possible. Um, yeah, by working with real world data set, messy and a lot of learning process. Thank you. One last question, then we're close. I, I promise we can keep this super quick. Yeah, yeah. If, if you want, um, I'm really interested in your panelists, how you would answer Susan's questions. If you want to question, if you want to do thumbs up, thumbs down, would you pause AI right now for six months? AI research. Don't pause. <laughs> let, let me tell you this, like, it, it's really, they know it doesn't work. Like, if you follow all social media, how they're talking about it. But it's kind of just signaling, 
we need to do something about it. People are saying, okay, if we do, like, how about the other companies? How about China? Like, it's not going to happen, that's for sure. But there is a huge debate, and the media is covering it. So slowing down, how, and, and some like uh, Yamla Kun, he's also one of the founders of AI in a way, and, machine, and deep learning, is saying, like, there's nothing there. What, why we're freaking out? <laughs> like, but some really, really AI thinkers, we're doing this, and there, is a, there will be a harm. And when, when you do like surveys and scientific survey, literally split 50-50 between your average Joe or really, really AI scientist, AI expert, totally split. This is why it's hard. And actually, Susan is gathering <laughs> feedback to write an article. So please kind of, you know, give your feedback. I would, uh, I, I'd say the arms race to, to make bigger and bigger models, sure, pause that. Um, I think it's really important to, to concentrate on bias reducing things, right? Because these models are learning from, from human texts, uh, so uh, from human generated, you know, things that we wrote, um, which means they have the same biases that we have. And if we're constructing something, we really should be able to do better because we know people have all sorts of biases um, you know, uh, in ter terms of uh, gender, for example. Uh, so I, I think there needs to be more work. Uh, the models have gotten strong. Um, I, I, I think the research on tempering them and doing something better than just recreating what, how people write um, uh, should, we, we need research to continue in that area. And ho hopefully it does. Yeah, I also agree. Just to put another more optimistic uh, side, a, a lot of us, I believe, are um, not very satisfied with a lot of repetitive work tasks. And if we, we can free some time by uh, using very good tool, unless it's less bias, then we can free some time to do something more creative and meaningful. So it's eventually trying to make life easier, but when something started, just get started, it can be a chaos. As a journalist, uh, my contract, it, it's actually tradition in journalism, but also specifically my contract says that in a public setting, I'm not supposed to take, uh, in a, you know, make my opinion clear um, because that could potentially alienate sources. So I want to hear from everybody. Okay. Thank you all. Round of applause for.